Okay, so um, what we're going to do now is go through uh, a fairly quick um, lecture on two-stage ammonia systems. Uh, these are typical in uh, big uh, food processing plants, that, particularly if they have freezer capacity. Um, the ones we visited uh, out of the, our, our industrial system center, over half of the big um, food processing plants had ammonia systems. Um, and and when, they, when they had them, they were nearly always two-stage systems. So we're going to talk about why that is and why they're ammonium. Then we'll also talk about how we go about evaluating them. So why ammonia as opposed to, you know, R22 or R134A or R410A? Um, mostly cost. Um, these new refrigerants, these halocarbons, um, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, they're very expensive. Um, they have to be, they're all synthesized to very these specific chemical um, specifications. Um, these systems that we're talking about are huge. They'll have tens of thousands of pounds of refrigerant. So cost of the refrigerant itself is very uh, important. Ammonia uh, can be produced at, at large scale, industrial scale. They've been doing it for decades. Um, and it's relatively cheap. Um, so, uh, And it, it has the right thermodynamic properties. Um, we'll talk a little bit, I think, um, and we look at the TS diagram of what makes for good thermodynamic properties. Uh, for a refrigerant, and it works over these very wide ranges of temperatures and pressures, and that's fair. that's what's really important. Um, it has an extremely low boiling point, uh, which means you can bring it down to really low suction pressures. And of course, the downside is that it's incredibly poisonous and toxic. It's uh, it 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 destroys uh, your lungs. Um, people die of um, a, a terrible death when they get exposed to uh, large amounts of ammonia. Um, uh, we we have uh, the fact that this happens so little, uh, particularly in the United States, is a tribute to how well we regulate it, how well we manage it, how good the plants that use it are at, at keeping an eye on it. So, um, you know, the only thing I could find in uh, recent um, news reports, and this is um, over a year ago, was in um, Shanghai, China, uh, and uh, it, it killed 15 people at this plant. So um, it happens maybe once or twice a year somewhere in the world, but it's pretty rare considering the number of ammonia systems that are in operation. So why a two-stage system? Well, um, if you have, particularly if you have a freezer, you know, you're taking uh, heat from a um, uh, very low temperature from the cold space and rejecting it to ambient, which can be very hot. Um, and of course the pressures uh, at the, the saturation pressures at those temperatures determines the, the, the pressure ratio or, or the you know the ratio between the outlet and the pressure of the compressor. Uh, we talk about this these systems being very large lifts. And if these pressure ratios get high, uh, it's hard to make the system work. It's also very um, inefficient. So uh, rule of thumb, a pressure ratio can be maybe as high as 5, uh, but not as high as 10. And these systems uh, for a single stage uh, would require a pressure ratio of about 10. So it's just not very practical to do it that way. And so what happens is, and what we know from our thermodynamics, is that multiple stage of compression with intercooling uh, is more efficient uh, thermodynamically. Um, I have found at least four different kinds of two-stage um, systems used in commercial refrigeration. A uh, cascade system, a uh, straight intercooler, intercooler with subcooler, and a flash drum. So for this discussion we're going to focus on the intercooler with subcooler. Um, in some cases you'll see them as two separate components in the machine room. In some cases they're included together. So in the drawing I'm going to look at them together, but they may not be at the, the same device. Um, so I put together this, this um, kind of cartoon, the schematic of what it looks like. So the first stage compressor um, is down here. So this is the first stage. Here's the second stage. Um, this is the, the intercooler with the subcooler. Uh, and, and so we'll, we'll walk, walk through this right now real quickly. So um, first stage compressor takes the vapor at suction pressure, takes it up to intercooler pressure. So these three lines and this tank are all at intercooler pressure. Um, there's a combination of vapor and uh, um, liquid in the intercooler, and there's actually a valve to maintain that liquid li line uh, at the same level. So this hot gas bubbles through here, gets cool, 
And um, it, as we know, the, the gas coming off a compressor is superheated. Well, this tanks the saturation, obviously, since both phases exist at the same time. So, uh, so this is superheated at intercooler pressure, but this is saturated vapor at intercooler pressure. So we've already, this is the effect of the cooling. Now we could have superheated vapor coming out of the second stage. This is the rooftop condenser, so this goes up here, turns the, all this hot superheated vapor into saturated liquid, goes to a high pressure receiver. This is um, uh, a usually fairly large tank that's, it can be outside, it can be in the machine room. It is uninsulated because it's roughly ambient temperature, it's 70, 80 degrees, somewhere in that region. Um, often painted orange in these ammonia systems. Um, it then goes down through the intercooler, and you'll see it branches. There's two paths the high-pressure liquid here can take. One is through this coil that's in the intercooler, so this is the sub-cooler, uh, and, then, and then down to the low pressure. Uh, but a small amount is actually expanded directly into the drum to mix with the outcome, outcome output of the lower-pressure uh, compressor, uh, and this is actually the refrigeration effect. The, this valve is controlled uh, by a float on this liquid here to maintain that liquid at a certain level. Uh, so it's not, it's usually not very much um, that's going in here, but it's enough to continually cool this, to, and it has two effects. It, it brings the, the, the refrigerant moving through here to saturation, from superheat to saturation, and it subcools this saturated liquid down here. Um, so, so, so the amount of mass flow that's being diverted in here is fairly small, and we'll talk about how much that is in a bit. Uh, now the liquid goes through this expansion valve uh, and drops from the from the high pressure. Now realize all of this from the from this point, the second stage compressor through the receiver through this intercooler. This is all at the high pressure side. That's at the discharge pressure. Um, now we go through this expansion valve to the lower pressure, the suction pressure, into this. Now this tank, the low pressure receiver, is uh, heavily insulated because this is very cold. It, it, you know, in these commercial systems, the typical temperature is minus 34 Fahrenheit, which is getting pretty close to where Fahrenheit and centigrade or Celsius uh, hit the same place. So it's around minus 38 uh, or 36 um, Celsius. This receiver has is also a saturation, has both phases in it. The, the gas, the vapor coming off the top is what is the inlet to the first phase, phase um, compressor. And uh, the liquid is recirculated through these nitrogen pumps through what's called overfed or recirculating evaporators. Uh, and they're, they're overfed because not everything evaporates as it goes through. You don't have pure gas coming out of these. Usually the amount of liquid flow through here versus the amount that's evaporated is about 3 to 1 or 4 to 1. So it's a pretty pretty liquidy mix that's still coming through. And then the, the gas settle, you know, rises up off the top and goes in the compressor. We will, uh, in future lectures, probably um, a couple weeks down the road, look at the other configurations. And, and the homework 3, which is a few weeks off, we'll be comparing and contrasting the other configurations. Okay, thermodynamically, we can look at this on a TS diagram. So that's entropy, or temperature entropy. This, by the way, is actually to scale. I programmed some of um, the ammonia properties into MATLAB, and so it's a graph that plot right out of MATLAB. So this is, um, you can't really see it very well, but this is entropy. Uh, and these are numbers taken from the Moran and Shapiro book. Um, I think it uses the same reference point. Uh, for entropy and enthalpy as the um, IRC calculator. Um, it's pretty close anyway. So this is 1.4, 1.6, 2.0 for, and this is in BTUs per pound degree R, and this is temperature Fahrenheit. So you can see that's 0, 50, 100. So it's a pretty big, pretty big span. What I, what I drew here was um, this cycle. And, and so you see two stages of compression from one to two. The intercooler brings it back down to saturation from superheat, goes up to four, then goes through the condenser all the way to five. So this is the the uh, the, the state at the uh, high pressure receiver. This is where the mass flow rate divides up between uh, goes to state six, which is what makes the intercooler work. And then some of it, most of it gets subcooled down uh, at the, on the same pressure. This is the high pressure 
a line of constant pressure, 7, 5 to 4, is all at discharge pressure. And this is just upstream of the, the, the final expansion valve, which brings us down to um, the, uh, uh, the low pressure receiver. And so um, what we want to do is look at the, the geometric interpretation of um, the TS diagram. And remember the line under, or the, the, the area under here, from here down to zero on an absolute scale. Remember, this is Fahrenheit, so if this is minus 100, you can think of Rankin, you know, in terms of zero on the, on the absolute scale is about minus 450. So even though I drew this way below the graph, it's, it actually goes longer if you're keeping it all the scale, but between 8 um, and 1. So this, this, the area of this curve represents, or this, I'm sorry, the area of this rectangle represents the refrigeration capacity on a per unit mass basis. Um, and so um, that gives us a really great graphical interpretation of why the two-stage system works. So um, I've modified this a little bit here. One of the things I did, I added a little dotted line that kept going from 5 to 6. So and I did this because, remember, 5 is the state of the high-pressure receiver. If, uh, if we don't have the intercooler, it means we don't get to subcool it down to 7. It means it, it expands. All of it goes through. Some of it might... Well, we don't have an intercooler anymore, so it all goes through all the way down to the low pressure, and this is the point at which uh, this is the the, um, the state that it, it is when it enters the the um, low pressure receiver. So the actual refrigeration capacity without the intercooler is a is a square that I don't show here, but it would start here, meaning that this rectangle I represent here is additional capacity that we got because the intercooler did the subcooling down to seven, and this was the point it entered the. Uh, this was the state when it entered the, um, the low pressure receiver. So, so that's that's the the intercooler gave us that. Um, uh, on the other hand, out here, if if we didn't have two stages of compression, um, we'd go from one all the way up to four, and and even you know that's assuming isotropic. So this is the point uh, that. Th th where we'd be at the outlet of the um, of a single stage of compression, and then it would come back down and superheat. Around. So the area enclosed in this contour, I'm sorry, in this contour, is the um, compressor work. And so we think of this area as um, work that's saved because of the intercooling effect to bring us back to saturation here. So that's a that's a very good thing. Uh, we get we get it on both sides. We pay for it by the fact that, now remember, these areas are per unit mass. We don't let all the mass that we compress go into the, go directly to refrigeration. Remember, we divert a little bit into the intercooler, and, and that's what we pay for it. But we still get, on, on balance, we get a very good, uh, very good take on this. It works out very well. Okay, so uh, here they are together, and again, we'll just kind of walk through this very quickly on the two. Hopefully, you'll be able to follow my cursor as I move along. So we'll start here with the vapor and the low-pressure receiver. That's state one. That's this point down here on the, on the saturation uh, dome. Um, assume an isentropic compression to state two. Uh, the intercooler brings us down to, to, um, to saturation because we have both states here. That valve at six is what's making sure that happens. Um, and, and this is, by the way, and I don't have this, the line of constant pressure um, for the intercooler pressure, but that's what's 6, 3, and 2 are all on that intercooler pressure line. So uh, the intercooler brings us to 3. We, we go into the second stage compressor. It runs up to 4 now. Now, now 4, 5, and 7 are on a line of constant pressure for the, um, uh, the discharge pressure. And... Um, Uh, and and so now we're here at what's coming off the condensers of saturated liquid. It gets subcooled through the intercooler, so now it's again staying on that line of constant pressure, but down here at state seven. It now moves through this expansion valve into the low pressure receiver to state eight, and and then the through the recirculation process and the evaporators, it slowly evaporates, comes back to one, and we complete the cycle. This line here represents the small amount of refrigerant that's diverted through this expansion valve, controlled by a level uh, sensor here, 
to keep this level uh, constant, uh, and and also and so that also brings you know has this nice effect on this end. Um, a little confusing, but not too bad. Uh, in the write-up that um, I have also posted to the website, I talked about uh, challenging the isentropic uh, assumption for the compressors. In other words, uh, you know, isentropic's not very realistic. It's not isentropic. There, there's some inefficiencies here, and we talked about how we can compute it. And, and so I, I, I add two more states, two prime and four prime. They're on these same lines of constant pressure, but they're a little bit further out and basically showing that the path from three to the actual four to four prime moves a little bit to the right. We do gain a little entropy um, and, and achieve a slightly higher enthalpy, which means it took more work to do that, which is, which is reasonable because, uh, because it will. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the, well, we've already talked quite a bit about the intercooler, but let's take a, a close-up look at it. Here's the high-pressure liquid coming off the high-pressure receiver. It, it splits into two streams here, one through the expansion valve, and so I've got this purple line showing a multi-phase mixture. The blues are liquid, the reds are vapor. Um, so this, on, on uh, this stream, I'm calling six, mixes in this intercooler, uh, with the uh, the vapor, superheated vapor coming off the first stage, the saturated vapor going back to the second stage. Uh, the other stream at this point uh, goes through a coil that's just immersed in this liquid uh, and vapor, not um, th but doesn't mix. Okay, so what we can do um, is an energy balance on the intercooler. So we've got four, four. Well, we actually have five streams, right? These two going in. Um, and this one, so three going in, the, the discharge of the um, first stage, the, 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 the stream going into the intercooler, or the subcooler, and the stream expanding, and the two going out are the um, suction of the second stage, and the, the subcooled liquid now, stage seven, going down uh, to expand down into the, um, in the uh, um, low pressure receiver. Okay, so here's our table, and you see it's a lot longer. You know, I have eight, t eight states, but I actually added two more. So there's actually ten states here. There's the eight states I've called out on the diagram, and then I've added these two prime states to show um, non-perfect compression. Uh, we start with the three states we know. We know three states already, uh, assuming we know suction, intercooler pressure, and discharge pressure. Okay, assuming we know those things, and, and that really determines the, the operation of the system. Um, the uh, the suction pressure is determined by a controller on the low pressure compressor. They'll 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 do as much, add or, or subtract as much com, uh, compression capacity to keep the suction pressure at a certain level. The intercooler pressure is determined by the controller on the high end of the um, uh, the, the second stage compressor, and the discharge pressure is usually determined by the condenser because how how much Water or air you're moving will determine what the temperature is up there, and that'll determine the discharge pressure. We know that the pressure, the vapor going into the first stage is saturated, so that's got a quality of zero. Um, and I just realized that's wrong. That's got a quality of one. I did that backwards. Um, I'm gonna have to correct that. Um, the again, the uh, the vapor going into the intercooler is one, and then the discharge pressure. Uh, the outlet of the, um, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to edit this out. So I'm going to call it quits on here, and we are going to um, pick this up after I've corrected these mistakes. <laughs>